That's very kind of you. Round of applause to start away. I'll leave now. It can only go downhill from here, really, can't it? But so uh, I was going to um, uh, talk about falls and fractures and research today. Is that what you were all expecting? Was you all in the right place? It's not, I've taken a wrong turn. Can anyone leave now to another more interesting session? Um, and I'll hopefully explain why I think that's important. Um, talk a little bit about why falls are important but actually why falls that end up with injuries, hip fracture being a very obvious one, uh, are particularly important. And then the, the final thing I like to do, and I'll do it now, and hopefully do it again at the end, is to say thank you. Because most of what we've done in this research is based entirely on the patients and the public's involvement and direction to actually set all of these projects up, which I'll tell you a bit more about now. And that's, that's deliberate and reflected the fact that in the past, we probably did things and did studies looking at things that were interesting for surgeons and for the physiotherapists and the anaesthetists and so on, and maybe less so for what the patients were interested in, which is something we've clearly got to change. Is anyone here uh, broken a bone? A few people, yep, that's sad. It's remarkably few, demographically speaking, because um, the number of injuries that happen, broken bones, is, is absolutely enormous. Anyone broken a hip? Wow, right, okay. Well, um, forgive me then, some of this will look painfully familiar. <laughs> so if, um, uh, if it does anything that's um, uh, causing too much, uh, bringing about too many memories, then please just let me know. Equally, I'd like this to be as informal uh, as possible. I understand we've got questions at the end, Cora, but if, if I, uh, anything comes up, anything you want to shout at me, please feel free. And I think, it, although it's slightly big room, uh, you know, I'm, I'm still happy to, to be interrupted, throw stuff if you like, if it's rubbish. Um, uh, we'll try and make it as informal as we can. Is that okay? So, um, what, is a, what is a fall? Well, this definition <laughs> comes from a very famous book, a little bit, um, a little bit depressing. Um, but actually, back in the um, latter part of the 19th century, when love in the time of cholera was uh, uh, set, I understand, then um, actually this was probably actually true. And I'll try and explain a bit more why. And although we've come quite a long way since then, this is still a major event. So falls and fractures is still a major event for people. And unfortunately, still associated with a very high number of deaths. So although it's not quite as depressing as this would suggest, things have not changed as much as we would like and we would hope to do in the future. So what is the definition of a fall? Well, this is it. I'll let you, you read that up on the, uh, on the screen there. And this is how Nice describes it, which you can't really argue with, <laughs> can you really? So I was meant to be here, and I ended up up there. Isn't that also a flag worth pushing? <laughs> well, yes, yeah, absolutely, completely involuntary. Yeah, absolutely. Well, for me as a trauma surgeon, I, when I think of falls, I kind of think of you know, workmen on scaffolding mm -hmm. and people jumping out of burning buildings and falls from height. But actually, the great majority of falls of course, occur from a, from a standing height. And yet, as we'll see, significant injuries can happen with just a fall from, from just a standing height, or even from a sitting height. But that's the definition we're working with anyway. So the big question is, are falls a problem? Well, what do you think? Is falling over a problem? Absolutely. And for, for me, on the other end of the falls, then it's a problem every time. But, but is it all, always a problem? Are falls inherently a problem. So this lady's got a big grin on her face. You can't see too well. It might be a grimace, actually, but she's actually deliberately set herself up. The purpose of this exercise is to fall off. And she's going to land, and hopefully she'll bounce, and that's, that's fine. So for her, that fall isn't a problem. It ticks the definition of a fall, but it isn't an issue. So which group of people, which group of us, people in general, fall most commonly? Sorry? Absolutely right. And the people that fall by far the most often are the kids. So when my kids were little, falling was a game. <laughs> they fell, they giggled, they bounced, they got up and they fell again. So I guess the real thing, the real question is, is, is falling a is problem? Well, it's not if you bounce and giggle and get back up. And in young people, that's normally what happens. And in most people, from a standing height, that's normally what happens. But it becomes a big problem if essentially you don't bounce. 
So if when you hit the ground something gives way, that's when falls become a major problem. And it, 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 ostensibly, although the, anyone can have an injury from a fall, even from a standing height, the falls that actually cause injuries are much more common in older patients, which is where I'm particularly interested. And I'll put this up, and I won't put many, I won't put many gory pictures up here, no surgical pictures, I promise. But this just is a lady that fell in a bathroom, just slipped over on a wet floor from a standing height. And she took um, medication to keep her blood thin, like warfarin or aspirin. And even relatively minor falls from a standing height can cause very significant bruising and like that. It's severely, very painful. And of course, doesn't look great as well. People are often very worried about that. This is a scan of someone's brain that fell from a standing height. And for those of you who look, you're looking at these pictures, this white stuff here is blood that's inside the skull. There's no skull fracture, but because the vessels there are fragile and occasionally people are on this blood thinning medication, then even a fall from a standing height can cause bleeding into the brain, which is obviously hugely significant. Fortunately, serious head injuries are still relatively rare, fortunately. What aren't, isn't rare is problems with bones. And the reason why the problems with bones happen in older people is to do with osteoporosis, so brittle bone disease. So this picture here on the, the, my right, your left, is normal bone magnified hugely. And bone's incredible stuff. Uh, it's my favourite bit of the body by uh, a long, long way. There's a few other candidates, but this, it's definitely the best thing. And it's this amazing mesh that is designed to withstand forces in lots of different directions. And the, the reason why bone is so much better than any material we can create in the engineering lab is because the bone remodels itself and strengthens itself according to what loads are put onto it. So that bone is constantly broken, or broken down and built back up again, and it's built back up in a way to, to respond to the loads applying it. So if you look at impact athletes, so long distance runners, they've got incredibly dense bone, whereas other people with more sedentary work, they put less stresses on their bones and therefore have less bone there. Unfortunately, we are only designed, humans, to live for about 30, 30 something years. So it's kind of all downhill from there, because we were like eaten by dinosaurs or whatever before we got to anywhere older than that. So unfortunately, our bones don't know that they're meant to carry on remodeling and strengthen themselves all the way through our lives into a much older age now. And what happens is gradually bone density is lost, so that in the end, you end up with bones that if we magnify them look like this. And this process happens from in ladies from about the age of 50 onwards, quite significantly increases in that stage. It's downhill from 30, but gets a bit faster from there. So even in what we now consider, obviously, to be very young people, um, it, you're still losing bone density from fairly early on. Now, you can imagine, just looking at these pictures, this person that falls over bounces. If this person falls over with this bone density, this is where we get fractures. So. Older people tend to fall more often, more often, but when they fall, the chance of them injuring a bone is significantly greater because of osteoporosis. So what are the consequences of falls? What fractures do we have for patients who are falling in this age group? This is uh, a wrist, a picture taken up like that, and we've got some little metal wires holding the bone in place, and there's a fracture across there. So this is the most common injury from a fall from height, and it, for obvious reasons, when you fall, hand out to save yourself. So the first thing that hits the ground is, is your hand. Because you tend to fall that way or put your hand that way, the wrist bends backwards, so you end up with that classic deformity of a wrist fracture. Anyone? Anyone got a broken wrist? Yes, yeah? In twice. twice? Oh dear. Same wrist. Same wrist twice, yeah. I don't know if that's better than both wrists, but anyway. Well, actually, uh, again, I'm not too surprised, because if you reach the age of 90, which increasingly we are doing in our society now, then you've got a 9% lifetime chance of breaking your wrist at some stage. You think about that and extrapolate that across the world, that's millions and millions of wrist fractures every year. There's around 100,000 at least, we don't even know about some of them, in the NHS in the UK each year. Now, wrist fracture um, are, is painful. It's a serious injury. It takes quite a long time to recover. Fortunately, most don't need surgery, actually. They will heal of their own accord fine. But once you've got over the pain and the fracture's healed, the effect on overall quality of life, although measurable, most people adapt and can get on with life reasonably happily after a wrist fracture. 
not everyone, but it, it's, it's not as big an injury as other injuries. The picture on this side, this is the thigh bone, and this is the ball in the socket of the hip here, and this is a, a hip fracture. So it's actually, technically speaking, a fracture at the top end of the theme of the thigh bone. We call it a, a hip fracture. That is a much more serious injury. And it occurs in a slightly different group of patients who are slightly older as well and may have slightly more in the way of osteoporosis. I don't know exactly why, but I suspect that one of the things that happens as we get older is we lose our reflexes and not quite as quick. So maybe when you're a little bit younger, you get your hand out to save yourself, and maybe as the years go on, you fall and you hit the ground a little bit more without your hand there to save yourself, and that's where you get a hip fracture. Other times, it's just bad luck in the way that you land. This is a particular problem because we know, and I'll, I'll hopefully show you some evidence now, some research, that actually this affects quality of life in a very, very significant way. If we go back to that quote from Marquez about the first fall means that you're old and the second fall is death, well, actually, if the first fall is a wrist fracture, the consequence of that being that you now feel vulnerable, because normally, previously you bounced and now you don't, and the second fall is a hip fracture, which still has a 25% mortality at one year I in this group, then actually Marquez's quote is still applicable today, even if he didn't quite mean it in, the, in our context. I'll ch I will cheer up in a bit, I promise you. It's not all down here. This graph just shows um, what's going to happen in the future. So this is just, um, it, sorry, it's not projected terribly well. This shows um, men and women um, and the distribution across different ages. So this is starting down the 30s here and up to 90 up at the top. This is 30 years ago. This is roughly now. So you can see this bulge of people here is drifting up. In 30 years' time, our society is going to look like this. So we are going to live longer. There's a group of people in their 50s now who are going to live, all the demographics say, will live well into their 50s, 80s and 90s. And so obviously this problem of falls and osteoporosis it is only going to get bigger. So for the individual patients, this is a big problem. But it's also a big problem for the NHS and actually for society as a whole. So this figure absolutely astounds me still. So 1.4% of total health and social care expenditure in the UK in established market economies all around the world is spent on looking after patients with hip fracture. It's very expensive to the NHS because people in hospital for a lot of time to get over these injuries. Those of you here, you know, you know we're talking weeks sometimes rather than days. But the biggest area of the cost is the social care afterwards, because often people lose the independence and therefore need more help in society uh, as well. So this is, in the UK, over £3 billion every year looking after patients with hip fractures. And with that bubble expanding number of people with this injury, this could cripple the NHS, if it's not crippled already. Careful, I would say. Be censored. So what, what can we do about the problem? Well, the first thing we could address is the falls, isn't it? That would be the obvious place to start. Because if we can prevent the falls, then maybe we don't have a problem with the fractures. So what can we do about this? Firstly, let's think about this from the, the medical point of view. Is there anything that we, uh, on the medical profession, and the allied health professionals, the physiotherapists, and, and uh, the occupational therapists can do to help? Well, there's quite a lot, actually, because falls are very seldom just trips. There's normally lots of factors affecting why patients fell, particularly in older patients who've got often lots of other medical problems associated with their falling. So we can think about gait and balance, and there's quite a bit of evidence now that very simple exercises, exercise programmes, classes, can actually improve people's balance and reduce the number of falls. We often talk a lot, or I talk a lot, about... Uh, brittle bone disease, bone density falling. But what happens that may contribute even more to injuries is actually reduction in muscle power. So there's a, a gradual reduction in the amount of muscle strength you have over time as well. And actually be not being able to catch yourself when you're wobbling it is a big thing. And we can work on that. There's, again, we can improve muscle strength with targeted exercise programs. We can all so look at vision. We know people with poor eyesight fall more often. 
people with neurological problems, so um, de developed ones like Parkinson's, for instance, fall more often because you just get stiffer. But also um, acquired things like a, after a stroke, you're more likely to, to fall. Heart problems, blood pressure problems. So if you feel faint when you stand up, you're more likely to fall. Unfortunately, a lot of the medication you use to treat medical conditions also make you feel faint when you stand up. And then there's um, the issue of cognition. So patients with dementia are much more likely to fall, as we'll talk a bit about a bit more later. So there's lots that we can do as the medical profession to try and improve things and reduce this uh, number of falls as well. This is uh, just an example about something relatively simple now about vision. This is a, a cataract. So the, the front of the lens of your eye gets um, misty. And so instead of being able to see the grandchildren like this, they end up looking a bit like this. Now, of course, that's a problem in that you want to be able to see your grandchildren. We all, all do. But it's also a problem in getting safely around your house. So does anyone know what this is? Yeah, I had to look pretty closely as well. So that's a staircase. You can just see the banister there. But the carpet makes that look like... And you can imagine, if you've got a cataract and you're going trying to, you know, so, yeah, very simple thing. You, just a change in the way that you're carpeted. So here, this, you can see the ginger cat quite clearly, but imagine that with the cataract. So there's a definite opportunity here to change the cat, I mean the carpet, <laughs> um, to actually improve things in there. So it can, it's, it's, it's obvious, but so often these falls are actually precipitated by things that maybe we could have spotted beforehand. And it's really simple things. So these are the socks, you know, with the grippy strips on. And so just changing your socks to something that's got a bit more grip on the lino floor it is going to make a difference to how often we fall. You know, rails around the house, strategic furniture, and so on. It is just very simple things that we can all do to try and reduce that risk. And society can do something as well. And this is incredibly cheap. You've, all that money we're spending on people that fall and break things. And yet, can you see the, uh, the crossing point here on the grey crossing point on the grey road with the grey pavement? Just a bit of paint there and a, a few lines on the street would allow people to cross without that risk of trying to find their way to the safe area to cross the road. So there's loads we could do as a society to try and improve that as well. So what about, um, however, I mean, it's fair to say that no matter what we do as individuals and as the medical profession and as a society in a public health way, people are still going to fall, inevitably, as we get older. That's, it's always going to happen. And so it's important that we try and also improve, not just reduce the risk of falling and the injuries themselves in the first place, but improve our treatments for the injuries. So we've had um, I, I, n not a huge exaggeration, so a revolution in trauma research in the UK over the last five or ten years. And that's not particularly difficult, really, because we started from a very low base. So about ten years ago, there were no major national trials of trauma. And there were several reasons for that. One of them is that it's very difficult in that setting to do research. So if, you, if you're going in with arthritis and you have a hip replacement, you know you've got arthritis and you know it's bad because you're going to see a surgeon about having a hip replacement, and you've thought about it a lot, and these days everyone's done an internet search and, and checked, and you know, even these days look up your surgeon or your hospital or where, where you want to go. But if you were on your way to the hospital about your arthritis appointment, fell in the street and broke your hip, the chances of you having thought about hip fractures and so on it, is very slim. So in the morning, most trauma patients don't know they were trauma patients, and they're quite pleased that they didn't know who are going to be a trauma patient. So doing research in that setting where people are suddenly taken from being normal in the morning to being severe pain, very vulnerable, disorientated by what's going on around them in very busy emergency department, trying to give information about studies to compare different treatments in that setting is very difficult. To the point where my profession kind of said, well, that's kind of a bit too difficult, so we won't bother. And that's got to be wrong. It's got to be wrong because all patients should have access to the opportunity to take part in research, but also because if we don't do the research to improve the treatments, the NHS just can't afford to keep treating people in the way it was doing before. So there's now this, not only is it morally right that patients should have the opportunity to take part in research, but also the NHS and society need it because we can't afford to continue doing the things that we're doing at the moment. 
So we've done a lot of research. We've got a big network of recruiting centres now, over 100 centres at the hospitals, about 200 hospitals that take broken people, acute hospitals in the UK. Over 100 now t regularly take part in, in research. Uh, hundreds of the surgeons. And to date, over, I think now, around 7,000 patients in the UK over the last few years have been able to take part in, in just randomised trials, these trials where we compare two types of treatment. And these are just some of the studies that we've been running, many of these from Oxford and my, with collaboration just up the other way, up the M40 at Warwick University where I used to work uh, as well. So what sort of things have we done and why is this important? Well, you'll recognise this wrist fracture picture again. And these were traditionally fixed with these metal wires um, called K wires in there. And in these wires are just little strips of wire with a sharp point and we spin them on a drill and w when you're asleep, you, we do give you some form of anaesthetic for this, we just skewer the two bits of bone in place. And they've been around for years and they, the total cost to do that operation of the wires and the consumables, the drapes and things, antiseptic, is about £54, so really cheap. These wires have been superseded in the NHS and indeed around the world by uh, these plates and screws that are on here. And these are called locking plates, really quite cool technology where the, there's a thread on the screw head and a counter thread on the plate. And when you screw them in, they create a fixed angled construct which grips particularly osteoporotic weak bone incredibly well. Also, they came in lots of different colours and were really shiny, so surgeons love them. So across the world, these things had faded out and these things were being used um, increasingly to the point where almost these had disappeared from use for broken wrists. The only slight problem was the cost to do this operation was £850. So every time we chose to do this operation rather than that one, we spent on the implant alone an extra £800. So the question was, I is that worth the money to the NHS? We thought, and the study we set up was to show how much better these were and whether the NHS could afford that benefit. When we did the study, and this was a big study all around the country, hundreds of patients taking part, 200 surgeons involved, we showed, fairly as clearly as we ever could, that actually the patients do just as well with those, which is a bit of a shock and slightly upsetting to a few of my colleagues who've been very keen on these fancy plates. And not, not all wrist fractures, so just to, in case any hand surgeons in the room might throw stuff, but for most people, actually patients do just as well with the wrist fractures. Now that's, that's quite interesting. Uh, I'm quite pleased. We've got a clear result from the study that you get the same result and it's much cheaper to use the, the wires. The NHS can spend the money elsewhere then. But the question is, what, what did the rest of the uh, community, what did the surgeons and the clinicians think? So this graph, I, I, I won't bore you with the details, showed the proportion of operations in the country having which type of surgery. So the red line is the number of uh, plates going in, and this is from 2005 to 2010. To so the five years before the trial, you can see that nearly everyone was getting a, a plate, and a few people, the blue line here, were, were getting wires for various reasons, but the plates dominated, and that had been static, that trend, for uh, five years before we did the did the study and then we did the study so what happened because the research is interesting for, for people who are interested like me and interested for surgeons but it's only useful to the NHS if people take notice and change their practice so to my absolute amazement not only did the surgeons read the literature and the patients as well but actually they changed their practice so since the study the number of plates has fallen and the number of wires has gone up. And there's a rough estimate of, if you imagine this gap here, the reduction in the number of plates, that equates to around one and a half million pounds a year in implant costs alone, year on year, that's saved because of the, the research, the message, and the fact that the surgeons listen to that research. So people often ask me, how can, it be, how can you justify spending you know, a million, two million pounds on running a big clinical trial? Well, this is the reason, because it pays for itself very quickly, as long as the surgeons take notice of the results, which is not always, always the case in there. So that's just an example of how we can change clinical practice with this sort of clinical research. So back to that um, uh, list of, um, I'll just go back here, of um, studies that we're doing at the moment. Well, these trials looking at um, broken wrists and broken shin bones and... Uh, upper arm bone, the proximal humerus, the shoulder, uh, and ankle fractures. 
The one thing that's missing off here is by far the biggest problem of all, which is the hip fracture. So why? Well, that can't be right. Surely the NHS should be investing in research in its biggest problem, by far its biggest problem, which is patients that not only fall, but fall and break their hips. And again, some more figures just, just illustrate the point that hip fracture is the single biggest problem in trauma. So each year around the world, 700,000 people a year die in injuries related to injuries to the hip. And in the UK, there are 70,000 cases each year, huge numbers of people each year that are having these injuries. This figure you've seen before, and it, it is without doubt the biggest problem in, in trauma in my, in my world. So uh, I, I work most of the time at the John Ratcliffe down the road, which is this major trauma centre. And we spend a lot of time talking and worrying about patients with multiple injuries and car crashes and so on, falling off motorbikes and things. But actually, that isn't the big problem for society. The big problem is older people falling and breaking their hip because their numbers are, are much bigger than those people riding motorbikes. Now, we've made some steps forward in how we uh, think and how we look after patients, some major steps forward recently with hip fracture. There were a whole series of reports over 20, 30 years um, which said how badly we looked after patients with hip fractures in the NHS. And even worse than just generally being bad, if everywhere was equally as bad, in a way that's maybe things are just bad, but actually the variation in the level of care and the quality of treatment and people's recovery around the NHS was huge. So there was no even standard badness. There was some really bad and some not quite as bad going on around the country but everyone agreed it was bad so what could we do about that well colleagues of mine uh, Professor Keith Willett who uh, works in the same department as me was instrumental along with a lot of other people in setting up um, something called the National Hip Fracture Database and this is basically an audit of the whole of the NHS pretty much the whole of the NHS so everyone with a hip fracture suddenly had their details recorded in a national audit program and how they were treated was also recorded in that programme. Interestingly, just by recording what happened to people and giving that information back to the hospitals, the death rate started to fall. So just by shining a spotlight on the problem, actually year on year, for five years, every year, the number of people dying after a hip fracture reduced. Only a little bit, but definitely each year as it went on. We then started, about five years ago, paying hospitals if they delivered treatment we thought was at the right standard. Death rates continue to fall a little bit more. So success, and huge success, because of the numbers involved and improvements in, in patient care. However, is death the only thing we should be measuring? That's the only thing we could actually measure within our audit programme. Now, that's quite a good outcome measure because it's normally fairly clear. <laughs> Liverpool play Man United tonight, and I know if Liverpool lose, both me and my son will feel in a, st a state somewhere between life and death. So I'm sure there are differences, <laughs> some states that feel like that, um, but actually, generally, life and death is very clear and very easy for us to measure in the, in the NHS. So if that's the most important thing to patients, then that's fine. We're, we're measuring something easily, and we can do it in large numbers, and then we can use that to change clinical practice. We did some research. We tried to run trials, randomised trials, so half the patients getting one implant or one treatment compared to half with the other in this framework. And one of the patients who was in the study actually happened to come see me in the clinic, had a problem with his, with his hip. And he said, oh, wh what happened with that study you were doing? And I said, oh, we've just finished, actually. The results are not published yet, but we actually found that the number of of people having more surgery um, was reduced in one of the new treatments and actually the death rate was just the same so there was no major risk in there. He said well that's interesting but that's not important. So it slightly took me by surprise there. So I said why, why do you say that? He said well I'm, I'm 88, I'm not afraid of surgery, I'm not afraid of having operations, if I, if I can get better I don't mind having two operations that's fine. And I'm 88, I'm not afraid of dying if I can't do the things in life I want to do, then how many years I live is not actually that important to me. I need to be able to do things that I want to do in my life. Now, you, you're sitting there thinking, that's obvious. 
slightly took the wind out of my sails. So we've been doing research measuring things that the patient said were not important to them, or at least not the most important thing. So we stopped doing research, and that's why there's no hip trials up in that listing there, until we could work out what we should be measuring as an outcome for the patients and what was important to them. And this was a, a lot of work, more than I thought. So we actually spent six years doing this, and we went right back to the beginning. So we decided to ask the question, can we measure outcome? You're familiar with this term PROMS? This is patient reported outcome measures. And this means not measuring what the surgeons or the uh, physiotherapists or the GPs think are important, but the patients reporting their own outcome back to the research team. Because ultimately, it's what the patients think that's important, not what I think is success. I might be delighted with my surgery. But if the patient's miserable, that's the most important thing. So can we measure the patients, what the patients think are important? Do we have the tools to do that? So with a lot of help from a lot of different people, we started talking to patients. And we did this in a very structured, formal way using interviews. Um, and we included patients with cognitive impairment, with dementia as well, and particularly their carers. Because up to 40% of patients who have a hip fracture have some degree of cognitive impairment. So getting their opinions and th what they thought was important, and their carers in particular, next of kin, the relatives, um, was very important as well. And we asked them, what was their experience of hip fracture? And which were the facets of their recovery that were most important to them? And this is why at the beginning I said, this is all about thanking the patients, because they gave up an enormous amount of time to actually help us to actually establish what were the important things for the patients. So what did we find? Well, there are, not too surprisingly, two groups of patients with hip fracture. There's a relatively small group of patients who are usually younger and often much more active whose expectation of recovery is to recover, to get back to where they were, or as close to it as possible where they were before. And that's very familiar to me because most of the patients I deal with that, what, what do you want to happen? I want to get back to where I was before. What we found that was really interesting, though, was the majority of patients the frailer elderly group of patients, older patients, with often lots of other medical problems, had no expectation to get back to normal at all. In fact, after they'd recovered from the initial problems of the hip fracture, left the hospital, they couldn't really talk to us about the effect of the hip fracture in isolation from them getting older in general. So the patients not only accepted that hip fracture was a part of getting older, but accepted that they wouldn't return to normal. They would adapt themselves to carry on with life, but no expectation of returning to actually normal, which again was a big surprise to me, although some of the research team in other areas had found that sort of thing before. What did we find out? What was important to the patients? Well, this is really, again, quite interesting for me. So mobility, not too surprising, was top of the list. But it wasn't, can you get your hip at 45 degrees you know, to the right angle? It's actually, can I get around day to day, around my home, to the shops, to, to wherever about general mobility, not specific to the hip. It's about daily activities of living. I need to be, I w it's independence. Can I do these things by myself? Was absolutely key to patients. Being able to look after themselves. Again, it's about I independence. I need to be able to look after myself to get dressed and get washed without requiring anyone's help was, was very important. This slightly surprised me. I underestimated this. Fear of falling. So I often thought that patients who'd had a hip fracture didn't leave the house because their hip was sore or their hip wasn't strong enough to get them around. Turned out a lot of patients didn't leave the house because they were so frightened of falling again that actually it stopped them actually getting out and about. Pain was in there, but it was much further down the list. So hip fracture, as those of you who've had the injury, will, will I'm sure confirm, is incredibly painful. My mother-in-law broke a hip, fell off a push bike, said it was childbirth times 10. I didn't know what I meant, of course, but uh, I thought that's got to be bad. So incredibly painful condition. But once, you're out, once you have the surgery and the pain then gets under control, that was in the, in later, in the few weeks afterwards, pain was less of an issue. And death was there, but right down the list. And again, the theme back again of, if I can't do the things in life, 
that I want to do, then actually how long I live is of less importance to me than actually quality of, of life. So we'd, we'd got something now, we got somewhere now, we'd, we'd worked out where the patients felt their recovery we should be aiming for in terms of recovery now. So the next question was, can we measure, can we measure outcome that's relevant to those areas of health that the patients think are important? So we did uh, something called a systematic review, and this was, again, not, not me, colleagues of mine who were experts in hunting the literature, the medical literature, and they reviewed thousands and thousands of papers they looked at not only every paper that ever reported on hip fractures, but every paper that ever reported a study looking at treatment of patients who were older. Every single study to say what have we measured, what outcome tools, measurement tools, have been used in all of these studies that have been done. And then they not only looked at those tools, but they looked at what we call the validation of those tools. So what is validation? It's pretty complicated, I don't fully understand it, but it's kind of the Ron Seal test. So it's the does it do what it says on the tin test. So we have lots of tools to measure things, but if they don't measure the things they're meant to be measuring, they're no use to us. So they also looked at the literature for validation of these outcome measures. And they basically came up with a short list of tools, of measurement tools, that we might be able to use for patients with hip fracture that match those areas of health the patients thought were important. And some of these things might be familiar with you, others less so. These two are very general health-related quality of life measurement tools. Just ask you about everything in your life. So anxiety and depression through to mobility issues. Hip scores, like the Oxford score, developed just down the road, funnily enough, um, are, well, it's an arthritis score, but actually turns out to be quite useful for looking at hip function as well in, in fracture. And this tool developed up the M40 in Birmingham. A lot of work done in the UK around this is um, a capability measure. It's a can you participate in the things you need to do measure, which seem to also tick that box of I need to be able to do <coughs> participate in things and independence and, and so on. So we now, we now have measured the things we, the patients think are, or we found out what the patients think are important, and we've got a short list of tools that might measure those things the patient, uh, patients think are important. So the next question was, can we measure? Can we use those tools to measure outcome for the patients? So we set up a, a study, a quite a large study of around 1,000 patients, consecutive patients with hip fracture, and we asked them, asked their permission, to quiz them after their injury and their recovery over the first year using all of these different tools. Again, huge burden for quite a frail, potentially you know, quite elderly group of patients to fill out lots of these questionnaires. Remarkably, nearly everyone said yes. Not everyone could fill out the forms, it turned out which is interesting, but most people wanted to help if they possibly could, and we gave up a lot of their time to do so. We also went back to the patients and interviewed them again to say, well, you know, does this tool actually, we think it collects the things you think are important, but does it? And also, what do you think about this? Do you think this, we could use this in large-scale research problems? Because a tool might measure things beautifully, but if it's 20 pages long, then the chances of getting a, you know, an 88-year-old patient with some early onset dementia to fill out that questionnaire, I impossible. And actually it turns out young people are much worse at filling out the questionnaires as well, so it's not just about older people. But we needed them to be practical, they need to be brief enough that patients would routinely be able to do that without feeling this huge burden. And what we found was that the simplest tool of all, a general health related quality of life tool called Euroqual, it's a European design tool, actually the Scottish actually with a lead lead people in this, developed again in the UK mostly, but with collaboration around Europe, was the, seemed to be the most practical tool that covered all the domains we thought were important, and it's just five questions. So we've honed down this huge number of outcome tools to one, which turned out to be about the simplest of all. And they just ask about anxiety, and about mobility, and self-care, and daily activities of living, and pain. And that's all that question does. Not only did we find that the patients were happy to fill out that form and completed it successfully, but interestingly, in a group of patients with hip fracture, it was just as responsive to changes over time as a specialist hip score. Because a hip fracture doesn't just affect your hip, it affects, as we've heard, your, your function globally. The fear issue, the mobility issue, the self-care issue. So actually, 
unlike in most areas, if you broke your wrist, a, a general five question outcome tool is very blunt tool. It doesn't detect subtle differences. But for hip fracture, it was almost as good, in fact, mostly as good as a specialist hip score, which is much, much um, more detailed. Also, this Euroqual tool can be applied through by proxy for patients with dementia. <coughs> so we can actually use it to ask the carers what they think about the quality of life of the patients before and after their injury. So suddenly we're getting something that this might actually be quite useful in, in large-scale research for um, patients with, uh, with a hip fracture. So the next element of this, and you can see now why this is five or six years' work, was to get everyone together. So we've got the patients and their carers back in, the researchers and the clinicians, everyone from the um, emergency department through the surgery to the rehabilitation into the community, all in a room. And we gave them all the data we collected beforehand in paper for them to read before they came and then presented it briefly again. And then we asked them to vote, just a consensus of which tools do you think we should apply in, this, in what we're trying to do, which is a core outcome set, the things we think are really important to measure for our, for our patients with hip fracture. And they, they managed it. It wasn't a particularly easy day. It went on a while, as you can imagine, a lot of discussion. But we got there. And they said that if we could take the patient's measurement of Euroqual and a three other very simple questions, the mortality one not, not beforehand, obviously if you were dead beforehand, there wouldn't be too much of a problem with the hip fracture, but if we could measure these things beforehand, and then at four months afterwards, then actually that would be enough for most patients to give us a good clue about how they had recovered. So, long-winded story. Thank you for bearing with me for that. So we've now got, we understand a little bit more about, a lot more about what the patients think are important. We've worked out which tools might measure those things the patients think are important. We've tested them, and now we've got a consensus about which of those tools we should take forward to use in research. Now we've got a platform, we might be able to do something here. We might be able to actually work out what treatments work and which ones don't for patients with hip fracture. So how could we use this? How could we use it alongside our audit process? Could we use it alongside our audit process to collect data that may be meaningful for patients to change practice? So what have we done? Well, we've now got 16 hip fracture centres around the country where all patients with a hip fracture are treated according to the national guidelines, a standard pathway from the moment they injure themselves through to discharge from the hospital and beyond. And they all collect the same outcome measures, that core outcome set, at before, retrospectively before the injury and then at, at four months afterwards. So what, what have we learned from all this? I'll, I'll just talk, can everyone see all that okay? It's not, it's a, it's not projecting quite as well as I'd, I'd hoped in here, but basically this graph shows um, health-related quality of life. So I love this scale because even I can understand this as a, a simple trauma surgeon. Zero here on the scale is a health state equivalent to being dead. Okay, very, we kind of got an idea what that would look like. This scale goes up to one, which is perfect health. That's the, the moment in your life when you were at your absolute peak. That's where you were. And this scale in between is everywhere in between. What we find is before injury up here, Patients who have a hip fracture, it turns out, aren't at the peak of health. Not too surprising. But actually, they're only at 0 0.6. So they've only got two-thirds of their peak health before they injured their hip. Immediately after they injured their hip, they end up here. And those of you at the eagle-eyed will realise that this dot is below dead. <laughs> and this is not made up. This scale does go to a health state worse than death. So if you imagine that you are, have fallen, you've broken your hip, you're in severe pain, you can't move at all, you can't look after yourself at all, you're very frightened about what's just happened, and you're worried about dying, then suddenly you can think, well, actually, that makes sense. Is that a health state we would want in preference to being dead? So actually, immediately after broken a hip, hopefully temporarily, you are in a state that actually could be considered to be worse than death and kind of makes sense. Fortunately, after initial treatment, you, you recover. And you recover very quickly in the first few days. And at four months here, that's when your recovery 
pretty much stopped. And again, those of you who eagle eyed will look at this difference between where you started and where patients end up. So on average, after a hip fracture, patients lose 20% of their general overall quality of life. And that loss at four months is permanent. So the patients beyond four months hardly had any recovery at all. Subgroup of the very active patients recovered a, a bit more, but for many patients, their actually health went down, which is probably age-related trajectory uh, again. So this is, this is now getting really interesting because for the first time in the UK, we've actually measured how big the problem is in not just in terms of morbidity, of, of mortality, people dying, but this is the effect on, on quality of life we've now been able to measure using these, these tools. And this staggered even me. I knew we'd got a problem, but I didn't realise quite how big a problem we have. So just to put that into context, 20% loss of health-related quality of life is like getting a diagnosis of MS or, or Parkinson's not quite stroke territory but it's it's getting there it's massive moment of hobby horse here if you think about the amount of research that goes into ms and parkinson's compared to the amount that goes into hip fracture it's non-existent and yet the health problem for society is, is the same magnitude same order before you move on sir so yes Oh, okay, so the, the, the one of them takes account of people that died. So um, in many research projects, people that died before four months, oh, they were fine, we're not going to include them. <laughs> so actually, it doesn't look as bad if you take out the people that, that died in there, but actually, of course, death is, a, is still a major outcome and is a health state. It's zero on that score. So if you include the people that died, which they would probably consider to be quite important, particularly the people that died, my wife um, got me this mug at, at Christmas. Complete aside, this is irrelevant, but... And it, it said, um, it, it's not uh, the person that dies that the, has the problem, it's the people they leave behind. He said, and the mug went on to say, it's the same when you're stupid. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, I, I thought that was... I, I had to think about that myself there, and I thought, that's not good, I'm not, I'm not impressed with that. But actually, for, uh, there is, there's definitely, it must be important to include people that died in, the, in taking into account health related quality of life. But even if you exclude all the people that died, there's still that quite large drop in health related quality of life. So, yes, that would have dotted in the full line. So. Could I ask you another question? Mm. Shall I go back? Yeah. Well, it's a very good question. Um, we, we're doing some work at the moment. We've asked the patients, as part of the, the questionnaires we're doing for follow-up for this study uh, now, um, how much rehabilitation, physiotherapy, occupational therapy input they had when they left hospital. Uh, you can probably imagine what the answer is. Yeah, very, very little, which is, which is a big problem. But interestingly, if quality of life actually pretty much doesn't alter from 30 days, then is putting rehabilitation into the community going to help or do we need to get in really early here and try and get this line to come up higher quicker? So this may help channel our resources into where we can have the most effect. And it may be community re rehabilitation is important. I, kind of empirically you'd think yes, but actually this graph would probably suggest that we should be front-loading the system to get the rehab in as early as we possibly can to try and get this line to bounce a bit higher at the beginning. Sorry, you had a question. Yeah. Good question, and it has been done. There's experiments with well, stem I cells. I'm going to go stem cells treatment at the moment. Oh, right, okay. Because I had to have my left, left leg amputated from a trauma accident in 2000. Yeah. Yep. You're getting boot out of the hospital bed system much quicker, which you need to do, because that's where it costs the money. Yeah. 
No, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. So, and if we could, if, if stem cells or order interventions... But £700 here that gets quality of life here, that, gets quality of life here yeah. that then reduces the, or increases the independence of people, will reduce the social care costs by thousands. So you're right. If we can get things in early, then maybe we can, we can alleviate the problem in the longer term. And stem cells is something that's really, really quite exciting, but still, before anyone gets too excited, very experimental for hip fractures, certainly for fracture healing. But there's lots of work going on. It's all quite exciting stuff. What else can we do? Well, these dotted lines, the coloured lines here, show the variation in outcome across different centres, the 16 centres involved in the research. These are quite early graphs, so these error bars, the, the, the precision of the answer, are quite wide. But you can already start to see there's quite considerable variation between hospitals. So now we can not just feedback how many patients died, we can feedback what the quality of life of the patients that, that survived or died is to the hospitals, who can then maybe target their resources at changing some of the process measures to improve outcome. So if in a hospital here, say, where the results are not looking as good, if their time to get patients to surgery is two days rather than one, then, then a, an obvious target would be to try and get that more resources into the operating room early, and then we can then measure how things can change. So we can use this same outcome set of outcome measures to report back to hospitals things that the patients, their patients think are important. So now we'll come full circle back to the, to the trials. If we've got all the patients in quite a large series now having the same treatment and having the same interventions and the same outcome measurement taken, that's a control group. That's a standard group. Now we can start comparing that standard treatment pathway to different treatment pathways. We can run clinical trials to try and change the pathway to improve the outcome and compare the results. Not only can we do that for one area, we can potentially run multiple trials of different things in parallel with the same group of core, same control group of standard treatment. Does that make any sense at all? So we can suddenly use our normal, normal routine care pathway to compare to changing lots of facets of our pathway to see whether we can improve things. And that's what we've started doing over the last few months. Work based in Oxford, but involving hospitals all around the country and increasingly in the future around the world. And we're looking at different types of immediate pain relief. Because we think if we can get the pain under control earlier, we can get people on their feet quicker, and therefore we might be able to kick, move that curve a bit to the left and get people up and about sooner. We're looking at different types of hip replacement. We've got some evidence now that trying to repair the hip doesn't give as good a function as replacing it in certain types of hip fracture. And if we can do a better hip replacement, then maybe we can get people on their feet and get them moving a bit quicker and a bit better. Some fractures, though, we still fix and we think they're better fixed, but our hip fracture implants, the, fi the screws and bolts we put people back together with, haven't changed much for 30 or 40 years. So we're trying new types of hip fracture fixation system, comparing it to the current, current standard. And then really importantly, we're looking at that very question about rehabilitation as well, about you know, can we improve the way that rehabilitation is given. And given that we now know that most of the benefit after treatments for a hip fracture occurs really early, we're actually targeting not the community resources, we're trying to get the people up and about straight away on the, on the wards. So in some units, already we're able to get people to surgery within 24 hours and on their feet within 36, which would be a huge step forward if we can replicate that across the country. Of course, that might not help, and that's why we need to do the trials. So, We're experimenting with all kinds of coated materials. So some of the new hip implants, the hip replacement implants, as I'm sure you're aware, use hydroxyapatite coating, which encourages us to integration. Um, the fixation device is less so, but there are coatings that are coming through uh, and probably more biologically active coating. I mean, we could even get to the point of osteogenesis, bone developing uh, substances, including potentially stem cells. Yeah, so all kinds of stuff going on. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And the same technology could, in theory, be applied to it. <coughs> yeah. 
I know. Some, yeah, the engineering stuff is incredible. I mean, some the guys in the engineering department just down the road in Oxford have yeah. done a lot of work in, in these sort of um, creating these meshes and embedding stem cells in them. And then over time, the, the mesh is replaced by, by tissue. Really cool, but very experimental. Oh. <laughs> yes, no, really good question. Uh, the answer is at their behest, although a lot of the work we've done in this area and elsewhere tells us that the patients do not want to be presented with the, you know, that big written information about the study beforehand, particularly in hip fractures. And of course, up to 40% of the patients uh, have got cognitive impairment, have some degree of dementia or at least temporarily can't, you know, use that information. So with the Ethics Committee's approval, we have a system whereby we give the patient as much information as they can take in and use beforehand, but try not to overload them, but get their written consent in the cold light of day after the interventions. So it's a really good question. Wherever we possibly can, we obviously try and get the patient's permission up front, but in cases where we, it just not is possible because of the nature of the injury and the treatment, because most patients with a hip fracture are filled with morphine, Immediately, you'll tick the box of no longer has capacity to weigh and use information. Um, you know, we'd never, you'd never give someone off the street morphine and ask them to sign, fill out a, a will or sign for their insurance or anything, but we still do it quite regularly in the hospital um, for clinical treatments. Can you sign here? Uh, so um, we've worked very hard with the patients and, uh, again, a lot of patients put a lot of time into this and the ethics committee to work out a process that suits everyone. But we... we very, very seldom would ever provide a, a new intervention to a patient who hadn't been able to consent for themselves up front unless they couldn't consent for themselves and we had to, as an emergency, use that intervention. I'll give you an example about where that might work. Sorry, I'll, I'll, I'll come back there. So if you, uh, we had, st for a while, we couldn't really do studies about um, <coughs> patients who'd had a, a cardiac arrest, whose heart stopped because it would be considered unethical to present them with a piece of information. So can you have a read of this and decide whether you want to take part? And when you've signed, we'll then treat you. So there's, a, there's now a mechanism in place, as you would hope, for patients to go into clinical studies without them giving consent beforehand, because obviously in that circumstance, they just couldn't. Otherwise, there'd never be any research. That's obvious. It's also obvious if you're having a, a hip replacement on the NHS, you're going to wait a little while and you've got plenty of time to read and weigh information. So you should never go into a study about having a hip replacement for arthritis without having considered that up front. And again, that, that's kind of accepted. No one would really argue with that. I work in this really weird grey area where it's not life or death. Literally, someone's dead and we have to try and start the heart again. It, but it still is so urgent that actually we need to get on and treat them. Otherwise, we know that if we wait, then the outcomes are worse. And that's where this research has really come in to ask the patients, what do you think? And in general, the great majority of patients have told us they would like to know what's going on, but they don't want to weigh and use lots of information about a study. We'd rather do that afterwards, and that's the model we've adopted. So sorry, long-winded answer, but that's where we've got to after a lot of work to try and find out what the patients wanted. Sorry, you had a question. Okay, I was just going to say, the, um, the graph that showed not much improvement after four months, was that just hip replacements, or was that fixed? Fixed hips as well. So that was all hip fractures. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, the question was, was it, was it a particular type of hip fracture, just the ones we replaced or all hip fractures? That graph is all hip fractures. The, as soon as we go into the subgroups of treatments and of injury types, because different types of hip fracture, um, then we start to lose the numbers. But we've now got, in the bigger study, over 5,000 patients in the study, and we'll very soon report on whether there's a difference between... And that may be the case, in which case, well, maybe we should be replacing more uh, and fixing less. Yeah. Yeah. And this work will hopefully allow us, I've got an inkling already, but none of it's published, uh, about where, we're gonna, where we'll be able to go. Now, in this sort of observational data, it, it's very difficult to say um, that one thing is better than another, because the patients who had the fixation will be inherently different from the ones who had the hip replacement. But they will give us an... Uh, then a good reason to do a trial where we randomly select people to one treatment or another to see whether that effect is real. Is that so this it gives us information to, to set up the next lot of studies, which are, are these things. These are the trials we're going to do.
an accident as in a fall or yeah well we we try and get patients to think the mantra at the moment is the next available trauma operating slot what we know is that if we operate immediately in the middle of the night the outcomes are worse which kind of makes sense because you don't really want your surgeon half asleep and the scrub staff at night there's a there's only one theatre team who do you know bowels and heads and everything they won't necessarily be as familiar with the kit so we think and there's pretty good evidence to say that you don't want to go straight away you want to go in the next slot where everyone knows what they're doing and is very familiar with the process but the sooner you get in the better in general so it's it's not quite that go straight from the resuscitation bay in the emergency department to theatre which we do occasionally for other injuries this is go to the ward settle in but then we'll go straight away as quickly as we can to the operating theatre It's, it's, and even in younger, the more active patients, the deficit in quality of life is, is huge. The good news for yourself is that the younger the patients are, the more chance there is of recovery, even much later. But we know it's a long-term problem. And is, it a long, is it a long time before you can get back to it? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And there will be a permanent problem, a permanent deficit. How much that troubles you as an individual, impossible to say right now. But there's still room for improvement even, even now. But you won't have the same hit that you had before, irrespective of how we treat people at the moment. And that's not been really negative about it. We're optimistic in the future. We'll try and improve that graph. But um, getting people back to exactly where they were before, we're a very long way away from that, I'm afraid, at, at the moment. They can do... Yeah, they're great adverts. Yeah. It's... Uh, it's seldom quite, quite like that in reality. No, some people do. And patients, young patients having hip replacements for arthritis problems or other problems around the hip, they're very fit and active beforehand and obviously find it much easier to get back to that level of function. Hip fracture patients are a very different group. Average age 84, usually got lots of other medical problems. They fell for a reason, which we know is not just bad luck now. The vision's not as good as it was. The balance is not as good as it was. The strength before they fell is not as good as it was. So recovery, <coughs> we, I, I've changed my sights, what we're aiming for. Better, quicker, but back to normal. That We're a long way from that, I'm afraid. So what are we, what are we doing? Where, where is this all, all taking us? And we'll finish now. Are we over time, Corey? Are we? Are we? Okay. I'll, I'll rattle through this last little bit. So we've now got um, a system whereby we're able to measure in a large number of patients with hip fracture outcome in, in an observational way just to see what happened. But also using that same system, we can now start testing these new interventions that may help people in the future. Everything from, as I say, painkillers through to different implants, through to different rehabilitation, potentially stem cells. So very briefly, what else are we up to? Just in case you're fed up with hip fractures. I'm losing my voice now, so it's enough, enough about hip fractures. Hip fractures, it, because it's so important in trauma, is, is major focus for our research in Oxford. But we're, we're kind of interested in lots of other things as well. So we're doing another study looking at broken wrists. Because if it turns out that the wires for most people are as good as the plates, what about if we just use an old-fashioned plaster cast? Can we avoid having any metal work for the patients? You know, any operation as such, can we just manipulate the fracture and use a cast hold? It's where we're, we're doing a trial comparing cast versus wires. We're looking at um, Achilles tendon ruptures. Anyone got, had an Achilles rupture? Yeah, a big problem or little? Yeah, oh, <laughs> terrible. I mean, because it's, it, it's not a broken bone, it gets terribly ignored, tendon problems. But we know that long-term health-related quality of life effects from Achilles tendons as well. So we're doing a very simple study comparing walking boots that you'd be familiar with from clinic these days with the traditional model of shaped plaster casts to see whether we can accelerate people's recovery after Achilles tendon ruptures. For patients with very serious injuries, we're looking at different types of wound dressing. For patients with um, multiple injuries after you know, car crashes and falls from heights and so on, infection in wounds is a massive problem, lifelong problem for somebody. If it gets in the bone, it's incredibly difficult to get rid of. Um, so we're looking at wound dressings. Can we use new fancy suction wound dressings to reduce the infection risk? And that's a, another trial, randomised trial that we're doing at the minute. And several other. I think we've got 16 
current trials in various stages happening based at Oxford and that we also support a lot of other units around the country to do research as well. And I think probably to end with, just to reiterate my thanks to maybe some people in this room were involved, I, I don't know off, offhand, um, but many, many people of the patients and their relatives and their carers with hip fracture and lots of these other conditions have now shaped the research for the future, telling us what we should measure, when we should measure it, uh, what would be important to them in their recovery. And if any of you would like to get more involved in that research at any level, whether it's just looking at documents and saying what you think about them, or we've had some people, I know some people in this room even, uh, have got involved much more in the research to the point where they actually join the teams to do the research, to shape the way that we actually deliver the, the trials in the future. And I think uh, Cora's... Uh, I don't know if there's anything on the feedback form, but if you, if you write your details in there, email addresses, however you'd like to contact us, and you would like to get more involved or at least find out more, you'd be very, very welcome to do so. Is that hip fracture <coughs> story that you did written up anywhere? Yes, so the, um, uh, you yeah, had several papers uh, around that. The, um, the, the graph with the changing quality of life is part of a, a paper in, uh, in the big orthopaedic journal called Bone and Joint Journal. Um, so, yeah, uh, which is available freely online as well. If you Google it, it will, it will come up as, as there. The, the Bone and Joint Journal. Right. Not a particularly catchy name, I know, but it says what it, I guess it's, it says what it, it does on the tin. So <laughs> it's all about bones and joints. There's, um, in the British Medical Journal, the open edition of that, the, the patient's views, that's in there. The, uh, the detailed statistical validation stuff is in Bone and Joint Research. If, I'm not suggesting you read that unless you're having trouble sleeping. Uh, statisticians will get upset with me for saying that, but it's a very technical bit of paper. So all of this work that you've heard about is in print or will be in print shortly. And the stuff about different types of fraction, different types of treatments and how they might differ, it is in, it, they're the things we'll publish in the next year or so. So. Yes. No. Absolutely right. So that, yeah, no, completely. So the pain, it's interesting, pain becomes much less of an issue later on for hip fracture patients, but in the first instance, it's the, as a, you know, I mentioned, it's the most severe pain that many patients say they've ever had. And the best painkiller we have is still morphine. But we also know morphine that makes you feel doolally and makes you feel sick and drops your blood pressure. Uh, and uh, don't worry, people don't get addicted. You only get addicted if you're taking morphine without pain. Yeah. yeah. So don't, don't worry about that. We're not going to make you all addicts uh, by giving you morphine. And actually, most patients who've had a hip fracture, maybe some people in the audience will tell me if I'm wrong here, surely, uh, they kind of want the best painkiller we've got. But one of the things we can do around the time of surgery are different ways to try and avoid morphine, using lots of local anaesthetics in the area to try and reduce the morphine afterwards. And hopefully in the future we'll have better painkillers when you first come through the door as well. And even before you get through the door. So the ambulance crews are now obviously given painkillers. Why don't you call beta blocks when... Why don't we use, sorry? Beta blockers. Beta blockers? Yeah. Or, or local anaesthetic blocks? Well, either beta blockers or I mean, beta blockers are a natural way of stopping the nerves working around the injury. So they will instantly numb it. Yeah, I mean, they tend to um, affect your heart more than the local pain killers but we are using local anaesthetic blocks um, and there's a trial going on led by the Swansea team at the moment trying to when you get to patients before because the, the most painful bit is getting scooped up off the floor and put in the back of the ambulance well, I think you be using absolutely and that's exactly what they're doing so they're training the paramedics to give an local anaesthetic blocks to try and relieve the pain so absolutely right sir and that's it it's such a key thing because everyone tells us that it's it's the pain when you first break the hip it, that's a key thing Are we out of time, Cora? Yes. I quite like this one. Uh, it, it <laughs> again, my kids found this uh, sort of for me. And yeah, they, they say I'm constantly telling them of stating the obvious. <laughs> but uh, anyway, listen, thank you all very much for, for listening. Thank you.